Mic check, mic check, one, two, we're good, we're on. All right, let's ready. Let's do this. Where's my, uh, there it is. My lovely, lovely mask, a mask. Oh, because I want to protect you guys, right? I want to protect you guys and ladies. All right. In five, four. Again, I'm going to be talking to people at home as well, okay? Well, we're filming it, okay? Just so everybody knows I'm talking and I'm not talking to you, you know what's going on. <laughs> All right, five, four, three, two. Good morning, evening, good day to all. Once again, my name is Diallo, and I have my lovely assistant here, Annie. Say hi, Annie. Hi, everybody. And for this current activity, we're going to be doing current events. And we do current events every Monday because lots of crazy stuff happens between Thursday and today. And I remember between Thursday and Monday, a lot of stuff can happen. Okay. So today is November 23rd, 2020. It's Monday, November 23rd, 2020. How amazing is that? It's 2020. Who would have thought? Like when you were 10 years old and you thought, oh, I can't, I wonder what it's going to be like in the year 2000. What do you think? They're going to be flying cars and stuff like that, right? Like if you watched the Twilight Zone when you were a kid, for sure you were going to have flying, flying cars by the time 2020 rolled around. Did we have flying cars? Well, planes. <laughs> I mean, there's literally highways in the sky of planes, so I guess those are kind of flying cars. But what they mean by a flying car is an actual four-wheeled car like you have outside that wings pop out, you can go flying in it and then land and then just park the car like down the street or park in a parking lot. People have tried, people have invented flying cars that have actually worked. The only problem is it's not practical because you can't just land down University Avenue here in Berkeley. Like, I'm gonna park now, right? You gotta, we gotta land an airport. <laughs> so, which would be fine if you lived in San Jose and let's say you worked at Concord. So literally you flew, you took off out of San Jose and then flew into Concord Airport, a small airport. That'd be good. Because literally you land, you have wings come in, and you just drive around to the freeway. That'd be good. But again, today is Monday, November 23rd, 2020. Now, this is the week of what great holiday? Thanksgiving. So I want everybody to think about what they're grateful for. Jose, what are you grateful for today? What are you grateful for? Christmas. You're thankful for Christmas. That's a good one. How about you, John? What are you thankful for? Okay. Miss Audrey, what are you thankful for? I'm grateful that I'm alive. That's a good one. Miss Annie, what are you grateful for? And my family. Your family. I'm grateful for being here with all of you folks and being able to interact, you know, interact, talk, and communicate and have be in a relationship with you folks. You at home as well. I'm very thankful I'm able to do this. You know, some would say, oh, you, you know, people go, oh, you go to work every day. I don't consider this work. I consider this another, just another part of my day, right? That's when you know you have a job that you absolutely love is when you don't consider it work every day. So I'm thankful for that. All right. So we're going to go with the East Bay Times here. Let's see what we got. We have local news and then we have news of everywhere else. We always end our, we always end our current events with our advice section and news of the weird, which is right there today. And we always end up with, we have an animal section to the end of okay, Let's look at, see what's going on here. So today, this morning in Berkeley, I, when I got on my car, it smelled like something was on fire. And guess what? Last night, there was a fire here in Berkeley. So Blaze burned seven-story affordable housing building. It was affordable housing that got burned down, which means a lot of people who can't afford housing have no place to live now. Oh, so let's see what this says. Berkeley, a six alarm fire burned a seven story building under construction Saturday in downtown Berkeley, authorities said. Five crews arrived at the 2000 block of University Avenue just west of Shattuck at 5.45 p.m. about six minutes after the first call 
regarding the blaze. Berkeley Firefighter Spokesman, um, Assistant Fire Chief Keith May said, the housing project at 2067 University Avenue is a seven story mixed, mixed, To page four, where it's continuing on. Let's use a mix. Is a mixed use. So let's start that sentence over. The housing project at 2067 University Avenue is a seven story mixed use building with 38 one bedroom and 12 two bedroom apartments and a 15,000 square foot of commercial space in the, on the ground floor. It was approved in 2016. An unknown number of residents at separate nearby apartment complexes were evacuated, but there were no reports of injuries, May said. Thank goodness. Firefighters still were working the fire well into Sunday, remaining on fire watch at the site into the early morning hours. Some fire units who had just left the scene around 4.40 a.m. had to respond to an unrelated two alarm fire at 9th and Delaware Streets. The fire, which apparently began in a parked recreational vehicle, spread to two homes and displaced six residents, authorities said. Hmm. Although there were no injuries reported, it served as a grim coda to a house fire Wednesday in the 1700 block of A Street, where firefighters fought the body of, found the body of an elderly man inside. Oh. Both fires both fires causes are still under investigation so they found an elderly man that was burnt uh, he couldn't get out he was probably making like a cup of coffee or some tea on the stove or something maybe he fell asleep and the fire oh, was terrible saturday night's fire was perhaps the city's largest since a four-story 39 apartment building caught fire almost exactly nine years ago the November 18, 2011 fire alarm blade, five alarm blaze, destroyed a building at the intersection of Telegraph and Hay Street, three blocks south of the university campus. So that's literally right down the street, which, yeah, that's literally right down the street, which I've seen that building when it burned down. So. Another prominent fire, a three alarm blaze, October 2nd, 2016, at First Congregational Church of Berkeley, uh, at, at a first congregational church of Berkeley building near the corner of Dana and Channing Street caused an estimated $2 million of damage. So that place is literally, I can see it right now. So the fire at the, the, the first congregational church of Berkeley, it's right in the corner here. I can, like this, I can see it. We go for walks, you can see it because the top half is, still has not been fixed because it's $2 million. The church has not had that much money. Oh, man. That's terrible. All right, let's see what else we got. Well, here's a kind of an interesting story. In Martinez, a rally calls for attention to medical case of East Bay murder defendant. Huh, so I wonder what that means. Yeah. So this is by Elliot Allman of the East Bay Times, the Bay Area News Group. Family and supporters on Sunday demanded the release of an 18-year-old man being held on murder charges at the Martinez Detention Facility, alleging uh, Tajan Shepard is not receiving proper medical care for a deteriorating condition. Shepard's mother, Lavette Alexander of Richmond, uh, led the rally to call attention to the health care issues at the Contra Costa County Jail, organizers said. <laughs> Shepard is charged with murder and with murder in the September shooting death of Kevin Santisban, who was 24 on Interstate 80 in San Pablo. Oh man, I mean, cold blooded murder yeah. on the freeway. Alexander said that her son entered jail last month and suddenly developed severe stutter, loss of mobility on his right side and memory loss. Ooh, sounds like a brain eating disease. This is not, this is not the kid I know and raised, said the said, said of Shepherd, who she added graduated in June from, uh, from Kennedy High School in Richmond. Alexander said she does not know if the symptoms are related to COVID-19, which has led to deadly outbreaks this year in California prisons. Alexander said she also wonders if her son suffered a stroke. 
Interesting. So this kid just graduated high school. So this June, he just graduated high school and he shot somebody dead. I was like, uh, that's, I don't even understand how you get to the point where you're gonna shoot somebody over on the freeway going 80 miles an hour. Oh, man, I feel bad for the kid. And I kind of do, I kind of don't. You murder somebody in cold blood. Ah, but at the same time, but at the same time, the kid's only 18, right? They're from zero to eight, from, from age. When he was born to that murder, I believe there's many interventions that could have happened so that kid would not have taken that route to end up murdering somebody. Maybe if he literally just changed one thing he did in the past, it would have changed the outcome and he would not have been in a position to murder somebody. Right, but hindsight's 2020, right? <laughs> Clearly, it is something she said, even if it's not a stroke. Alexander said repeated, Alexander said repeated requests for a comprehensive medical examination of Shepard have been ignored by the Contra Costa, Contra Costa Sheriff's Department, which operates a detention facility. A spokesman for the Sheriff's Department declined to comment Sunday. He referred questions to the county's Health Services Department. A spokeswoman for health services did not immediately respond to an email that we were seeking a comment. We're demanding, we're demanding a diagnosis, said Courtney Morris, of No Justice Under Capitalism, a group that has staged demonstrations at California prisons this year because of a large number of novel coronavirus cases in the prisons. We're demanding that uh, Tejan Shepard's health issues be taken seriously. Moore said family members don't know if Shepard has been tested for coronavirus or not. The protesters Sunday requested that Shepard be released to a public health facility or to his family's family pending trial. Shepard is currently being held without bail. I guarantee you he was, never mind, won't go there. Alexander said, he, said her son's next court appearance is December 15th. That's if he's still alive. He had been working at a Richmond grocery store, she said, and planned to study criminal justice at the Apple Valley College in East Bay in the coming year. Alexander said Shepard cannot remember his birthday or close friends. She said jail physicians told her Shepard showed no abnormalities after undergoing a CAT scan and MRI scan. Alexander's, Alexander said Sunday's protest was to support proper health care for all incarcerated people. My son just seems to be another case. Another cog in the wheel, she said. And I don't know what to think of that. Because, you know, he could be deteriorating or he could be faking it. There's lots of cases, there's lots of instances where prisoners have faked being mentally ill so they get a lesser sentence, right? There was a mob boss in the 90s who the FBI and everybody had no idea he was the boss of the, of the biggest mafia mob crime family in New York. The police had no idea why, because he would walk around in a bathroom, boxers with pee on them, and he with the hat on and shuffling around and saying, talking to himself, talking to talking to, uh, to coin meters. <laughs> like, he did all this stuff because he wanted to act crazy outside, so they would never suspect that. So they would never suspect that he was the leader of the biggest mob in, in New York at the time. Well, he's dead now. They finally caught up to him. They realized he was faking it. <laughs> so here's a much more uplifting story from San Leandro. Drive-by party for 101-year-old. Pearl Harbor survival. Pearl Harbor survivor Michael Ganich waves at Alameda County Toys for Tots coordinator Danielle Cardonis. Friends and current current and former military members from his lawn during a drive-by birthday celebration as he turns 101 years old in San Leandro on Saturday. The event was organized by members of the Alameda County Toys for Tots drive in which an Alameda fire engine led the drive-by followed by vehicles, some of them waving American flags. So that's awesome. Not only did they celebrate his 101 birthday, but he's a veteran as well. He was at Pearl Harbor. He was at pretty survived Pearl Harbor. Oh, that's got to be so scary. I'm sorry. 
don't think people realize what war is today. Unless you're in the military and you've been to the Middle East, most, most Americans, we've been sheltered for so long, we don't know what war is. We think, oh, we should have a revolution and do a civil war. You don't want that bloodshed. You do not want your neighbor's blood running down the street. Why? Because you disagreed on what kind of eggs you like. Poached or scrambled, <laughs> right? Uh, humans are crazy. What's that? Seriously. Yep. So let's see what we've got. What else we got in our local news? Would you like to read some obituaries? Sometimes they're good. <laughs> no, let's not do that. Because I don't like it. Some obituaries are good, but I don't like thinking about that, right? Mm -hmm. Thinking about passing away. It's kind of scary. But some of the best questions that a kid, like if, a, if, a, if one of your grandchildren or children are terrified of dying, I've heard this one thing you can say to them that 95% of the time they'll never ask again, that they're, or they'll never say they're afraid. And it's like, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, I I'm scared of dying. And you say, or I'm scared, I don't know, because I don't know what happens after you die. And you say to them, well, do you remember what happened before you were alive? And they think about it, they're like, no. And it's like, there you go. You don't remember before you were alive. It will make you remember if you're after alive, right? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna look at our advice column. We have advice with Ask Amy, and we have Miss Manners. So let's start with Miss Manners first. Shaming and cancel culture. So again, people are writing questions and advice to these people and then they're responding. So the first part is like say, uh, a random person wrote to, to, to Miss Manners, Judith Martin. So dear Miss Manners, it would seem that we have lost the art of social sh social shunning. I simply ignore and have nothing to do with bad people in public or in my private life. As mentioned, you quickly move away in obvious horror from such people when you see or encounter them. They will eventually get it. If not, no loss to me. That's kind of mean. She's basically saying that if she doesn't, if you do not agree with her politically, then you're a bad and evil person. She wants nothing to do with you, which is scary. Because that, 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 those are the seeds for civil unrest. If people don't, if you don't like your neighbor because let's say he voted for Trump and you despise him for that, that's horrible. It's a lack of communication. That's how, that's how countries go to civil war, just for that. Little things like that. So here's Miss Manner's reply. Dear reader, lost the art of social shunning. Okay? On the contrary, it has spun out of control. There are two new versions, shaming and cancel culture. Miss Manners congratulates you for reframing from using those weapons casually. Yet excluding people whom one or society considers reprehensible is etiquette's chief form of defense, other than setting an example of courtesy in the face of rudeness, which doesn't always have indulgible results. While the law can administer harsh penalties when it is flouted, Disapproval is the only sanctioned etiquette, only sanctioned, only sanctioned etiquette has against rudeness. And this often, then this has often been, dis, dis, been dismissed as ridiculously weak. But for centuries, children born outside of marriage received lifetime stigmas. When bans and quotas against race and religion were legally challenged, Codified bigotry persisted in private institutions, including not just clubs, but neighborhoods and schools. And the ease of, go of going public online has encouraged rash and sometimes unfounded judgments against individuals and businesses without gradation of punishment suited to the severity of the transgressions. So basically what that means is you, um, you accidentally bumped into somebody. We're going to give you the death penalty for that. <laughs> right, we're gonna, we're gonna chop off your head for that. So the, the, again, the punishment that they give on social media and in the public doesn't fit the crime a lot of times. Vigil, vigilante rule is cruel and unjust. 
So is Miss Manners willing to surrender etiquette? Etiquette's one weapon? No. Most atrocious, much atrocious behavior has been exposed. Unmistakable photographic evidence has documented actions that have otherwise been easily denied. The old warning was, don't do anything you would be ashamed to see on the front page of the paper. Now, even shameless people should, real, should realize that there are consequences to being seen online with behavior that, used to, that you used to be able to get away with. That's very true. Right, what was okay 10 years ago is now completely against the law, the law of online etiquette. <laughs> Miss Manners lives in hope that people will learn to care enough about their reputation to curb their offensive words and deeds. But that requires a belief in reputation and an adjustment on the part of well-meaning society to the popular concept of being non-judgmental, which our society has a huge problem with. Everybody judgmental about everybody. It's more so now than ever in the history of the United States, right? Everybody is, is judgmental about anything, you, the way you look, the way you, you sing, the way you taste food, right? Deeds count. Miss Manners is bewildered by the current ex explanation of wrongdoers. This is not who I am. Well, then, who is it who did what? Who, well, then. Who is it who did what you did? Whom do we hold accountable? And what if your doppelganger, dop, doppelganger takes over again? You know what a doppelganger is? It's like having it's like a doppelganger. It's like having a twin, but it, like having a twin, but it's not your twin. So let's say me and Jose, I, I was me, and Jose looked exactly like me. So he could be my, my doppelganger. Mm -hmm. Miss Manners is not without mercy in viewing those accounts. She requires it, she requires accusers to be sure of their facts and to keep their condemnation in, in proportion to the transgressions. She believes that redemption through remorse and reparations. And she agrees with you about avoiding pointless street confrontations. Hmm. So that, that response was just kind of jumbled and making so much sense. That's okay. So now we're going to ask Amy. Husband seeks seeks words to leave. Ooh, what do you think that means? But husband seeks work seeks advice on words to leave. Maybe. Maybe is what? Let's find out. Dear Amy, my wife and I have been together for 12 years. We started dating in high school and moved in together during college. Excuse me, I had a burp right there. I had some gas coming up. Let's start that over again. My wife and I, dear Amy, my wife and I have been together for 12 years. We started dating in high school and moved in together during college. After college, she moved back into a hostile home environment of her parents' dysfunctional marriage, adultery, alcoholism, constant fighting, and blatant lying. That's a tough environment to grow up in. I was on the fence about staying together, but I couldn't leave her to deal with all that without my emotional support and comfort good man. This went on for a few years until her grandfather until her grandfather started buying homes for his grandchildren and offered one of the homes for us if and when we got married. I thought this would be a great way to start fresh with that's nice. Grand, grandfather buying him a home in the Bay Area. Woo! I want a grandpa like that. Man, he's gonna buy me a home if I get married. Hey Audrey, let's get married. <laughs> we get that house. <laughs> I was on the fence about staying together, but I couldn't leave um, her to deal with all that without my emotional support and comfort. This went on for years until our grandfather started buying homes for his grandchildren and offered one of the homes for us if and when we got married. I thought this would be a great way to start fresh with a home that was paid for, that was paid for already and that we could build our relationship. I knew it wasn't the best way to start a marriage with the feeling. I knew it wasn't the best way to start a marriage with the feelings I had about leaving her, but I couldn't resist the urge to remove her from a terrible situation. So here, so we got this. She's, they, they've been together since high school. She lives in a terrible situation at home. He loves her, but he doesn't love her to really marry her, but he feels guilty because she's in a horrible environment and she's gonna get married so he can be, you know, Prince Charming coming and, and sweeping her off her feet, right? 
right? He's gonna be Captain, Captain, what they call Captain Zabo, <laughs> right? He's gonna come sweep this lady off her feet and take her away from all the, the, the dissidents and everything. But it might not work that way, let's see. I knew it wasn't the best way to start a marriage with the feelings I had about leaving her, but I couldn't resist the urge to remove her from her terrible situation. Things were good for a while, but as we spent more time together, it became apparent that our futures looked very different. Mainly, she wants to start a family while I was unsure about having children, especially with her. Wow. Maybe they together for 12 years and he's felt like this? She has made it clear that if I don't come around, this could be a reason to end the relationship. Should I tell her that, so I tell her the truth of how and why we got to where we are? Should I, or should I just let her, or should I just let the not wanting children thing be the less hurtful of the two scenarios as the reason to end things? I feel like he literally just stole part of her life. I really do. I, I think this guy is an asshole. Instead of saying 12 years ago, you know what? I, mean, I just don't see us being together. Like you think they would have? You think they would have had the conversation about kids 12 years ago, right? He didn't want to have kids. Boom, relationship over. Move on. She gets married to somebody else. Now she got a couple kids. Like this guy. Oh. I'm sorry, this is horrible. Oh, he's very selfish. I guarantee you he's very dominant over her too. So let, let's hear let's hear the answer from uh from Amy. Dear Wander, dear Wander wondering, even though you maintain even though you maintain that your relationship has not been satisfying for you, you cast yourself as your wife's rescuer from her abusive home life. Yeah, that's what I just said, right? He's like saving her from this stuff. He's, he's the hero, <laughs> which is getting selfish on his part. Oh. So even though you maintain that your relationship has not been satisfying for you, you cast yourself as your wife's rescuer from her abusive home life. However, really it was her grandfather's le legacy of a house that seems to have liberated her from the ho that household. You're mar uh, you're mar you married her in order to help that along, but surely you saw some benefits too. Exactly. He's like, well, if I marry her, I get a house. Sure. <laughs> you know? I think he literally just stole part of her life, especially the part where, you know, she was most uh, adept at having children, right? At that young age, having children. So she's not 50 years old when she starts having kids. Ugh. Marriages start and then fail for all sorts of reasons. No matter what you tell your wife as you are leaving, it will only be partly true from her for her because if she if she is deeply hurt, she will assign reason on her own accord. Just don't blame her for your choice to leave. You can tell her, it's not you, it's me. I'm conflicted about having children. I know you want them. I haven't been happy for a long time, and I don't think you are either. We started our lives together when we were so young and we grew up together, but now we've just, just grown apart. Just don't tell her, I don't believe I ever loved you. Oh, shit, I hope he wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, babe, I, I'm sorry, but I, you know, I, I just never loved you. Wow. He would get a swift kick in the balls with that, <laughs> with that, man, with that response. Man. All right, our next dear Amy. Dear Amy. I think, I think all of you have missed a logical and simple response to anxious wife, whose husband is a dangerous driver due to his speeding and tailgating. I have experienced the same. I finally asked myself, why am I subjecting myself to this anxiety? I know how to drive. Right? The solution is don't get in the car with him. She should, she should be doing the driving. <laughs> so dear less anxious, Yes, any person with the option should definitely take it. <laughs> so I guess somebody wrote in and said, I don't know how to tell my husband that he's driving too fast and making me really anxious. It's like, well, you can drive yourself, <laughs> right? She knows how to drive. She can drive herself. All right, so let's move over to our tail end of our current events. We are going to look at... that paper up a little bit. We're going to look at animal section. We're going to do news of the day and news of the weird. Almost. Let's look at some of this stuff in here.
So here's an interesting one, right? We know we have the pandemic going on right now. So this is this is about the coronavirus. Inequality, inequality baked into testing access as cases surge. So basically, people, especially in inner cities, who are who are less fortunate under the poverty line are generally minorities, and because of that, it, they generally don't have cars or, or access to really transportation, or they're scared right now because of the virus to go on public transportation. It was hard for them to get to. to uh, access points to where they can get tested to see if they have the virus or not. So let's see what this says. And this article is by Christian Fernando and Carolyn Thompson from the Associated Press. The day after Amanda Serelnik Cyril, found out that she might have been exposed to COVID-19, she visited a rapid testing center in New Jersey, but was turned away because they ran out of tests. She returned at 7 a.m. the next day after waiting for an hour. Officials said um, after she returned at 7 a.m. the next day. After waiting for an hour, officials said that they had to run out again. Wow. So she got there at 7 o'clock in the morning. And at 8 o'clock, the thing place opened at 7. And by 8 o'clock, they were out of test. There's a shortage of tests right there. Because they can't make them fast enough. We get them out fast enough. Our infrastructure is not made for that. Let's see here. So again, she returned at 7 a.m. the next day. After waiting for an hour, officials said they had run out of tests again. On her third try, Suronek and her friend called several testing centers before driving for an hour to one with availability. Lines for free coronavirus tests stretched for blocks and hours in cities where people feel the dual strain of the coronavirus surge and the approaching holidays. But an increasing number of pop-up cl uh, clinics promise visitors instant results at a cost some charge 150 dollars or more for a spot at the front of the queue wow and i bet you there's there's, there's very inventive people especially young people who are making money off this because what they're doing is they're staying they're getting in line first and they put an ad up on craigslist that said i'm so and so i'm second in line I'll give you the spot if you pay me hundred dollars. People will give them hundred dollars to do it because they want to make sure they get a test, right? And that if they have coronavirus, they're going to get treated early on in the, in the virus and not late. A lot of people die because they just get treated late, and everything's set in, and then they, they end up passing away. Sad. While her friend, while her friend, who lacked insurance, had to pay one hundred twenty-five dollars for the test. Sir, the next price was only 35. The real cost came from the two days she had to take off from work, she said. So again, it only cost her $35, but she had to take two days off of work. So really it cost her about $500. No, maybe about, it cost her about $250 overall because she had to miss work for two days. Man, let's see. People are just trying to get by and they can't, be taking off of work for a week to wait for results. That's very true because if you get the test, right? You have to, you can't go back to work until you get the results. So I remember the very first COVID test I got, you know how long it took me to get the test results back? 12 days. So I couldn't come, I couldn't come here for like 12 days. I kept emailing my doctor like, why is it taking so long? Like if I have COVID, I'm, I'm, and I'm, gonna die, I'm dead before the test results even come back, right? It doesn't make any sense. It shouldn't take 12 days to get results. It's pointless at that point. Literally, because I could have been infected, you know, from the moment after I took the test, those 12 days, I could have been infected by anybody. Stupid. Okay, so where are we? People are just trying to get by, and they can't be taking off of work for a week waiting for results, said Sir Nick, who works at a spa. People need rapid testing to be available and affordable to them. Dr. Mark Shrine said his work gave him the flexibility to wait in line six hours for a test in New York City last week, but he knows not everyone can do the same. Wow. If I'm a, if I am an hourly worker, I can't take off six hours just so I can get a test so I can go back to work, said Shrine, who needed, who needed a test to avoid a 14-day quarantine after traveling from Boston. Another option was another place 10 blocks away from where I could pay 250 bucks to get a rapid test. So the structure that we set up for people to be able to keep themselves safe from COVID baked into these structures is at an inequality. Oh well, yeah, 
Because basically what it says, if you have money and, and time, you can get your test really quickly. But poor, you know, less people that aren't up the up the up, up and down the ladder are at the mercy of the system. Because they don't have the extra money to pay to get the rapid test. But also at the same time, they can't take off a of work for a week and a half waiting for the results. Even though some of the cases, they if they have the money, they should pay that extra money because in the long run, they're going to end up losing more money by, by having to wait for the longer test. Cernick hmm. says it's been frustrating to watch people do rapid tests so that they can go to parties or travel for holidays. Some people who need rapid, rapid testing, some people who need rapid testing to work can't afford it, she said. It's not fair. The majority of people are in my position. As the, numbers as the numbers of infection cases climb in the United States and the country faces what health experts say will be a dark winter due to the uncontrolled spread of the virus, the demand for testing becomes greater. The U.S. has had, the US has had more than 12 million reported cases and more than 255,000 deaths from the coronavirus since the start of the pandemic. And 12 million reported cases. There's some people, there's some epidemiologists who actually think that number is double or triple that. So they're talking about like 100 million people that have probably been infected, which would be a third of, which 100 million people would be approximately a third of the American population that have that it. Mm -hmm. Social worker Chelsea Collins said she had to pay $150 for a test at a drugstore after she lost her insurance due to the pandemic. After her husband, after her husband, a union painter, learned, um, learned he may have been exposed to COVID-19 last week, she was faced with finding a way to get tested again. After visiting a free drive through testing site at 5.30 a.m. in Scranton, Pennsylvania on Saturday and waiting about an hour and a half, an hour and a half to two hours for a test, the 32-year-old Cullen said she, she considered herself lucky, but she thought about those without the means to get, the, get to a testing site not served by public transit. I feel for a lot of people with families at the holidays and having to shell out $150 because they're exposed, Colin said. Dan Fulweiler, president and CEO of Esperanza Health Centers in Southwest Chicago, said costly rapid test centers won't help the communities that, that his nonprofit serves. About 70% of the center's clients live in poverty, according to his estimate. Fulweiler laments the lack of national testing strategy that's led to the proliferation of pop-up clinics. Daily demand also has risen at it, as Esperanza, the Spanish word for hope, from up to 150 in the summer to 400 now. So Esperanza means summer. Mm -hmm. Esperanza means summer. Yeah. So summer, Esperanza. Mm -hmm. I did, did not know that. You learn something new every day. So for us non-Spanish speaking, Esperanza, means summer, summer, yes. So when you hear people's last name is like Tony Esperanza, his name is Tony Summer, <laughs> Tony Summers. Let's see, where are we here? It's not just the cost and access that are raising questions about rapid tests. Rapid testing sites could create a lot of headaches for a lot of us who are trying to understand certain understand surveillance data, said uh, Jaylene Gerardin, an epidemiologist and infection disease. What's that? Okay. So rapid testing sites could create a lot of headaches for those of us who are trying to understand surveillance data, said Jaylene Gerardin, an epidemiologist and infectious disease monitor who helps compile weekly forecasts of pandemic trends for the Illinois Department of Public Health. And, all right. Let's see what we got here. Ooh, here's an interesting story. So this is, we always read animal life, okay? So things that happen in the Bay Area has to do with animals. So bi bicyclists pursued by snarling dog on trail seek safety tips. Woo. So let's see what this means. Whoa, there goes my thing. Let's take the hat off then. That'll work. But I'm a head too little. <laughs> so again, bicyclists pursued 
by snarling dog on, tra on trail seek safety tips. So Animal Life is always done by Joanne Morris. So people, they write to Joanne. So it says, dear Joanne, I was riding my bike on the bike path south of Caltrain's uh, Tamian Station when a homeless woman's dog off leash tried to attack me as I rode by. She called the dog who obviously ignored her. Only by cycling at maximum speed was I able to outrun it. It was very frightening. I, fled, I filed a, and I filed a police report. I wonder what advice you would have for someone, in this case on a bike, who was threatened by a medium to large, uh, large size snarling dog off leash. The trail I was on was too narrow to turn around, but there wouldn't have been any time to do so anyway. Did I outrun it at 23 miles an hour or did it just tire of chasing me? Also, and more importantly, what should one do when being chased by a snarling fairly large dog? It was truly maddening. I was trying madly to bite. It was trying madly to bite me for the bite. I'm not sure which. And he's Alan Hughes from San Jose. Wow. So let's see what Joanne has to say. Dear Alan, let me first say I'm glad you escaped that injury. You reacted on instinct, which, as it turns out, was exactly the right thing to do. Dogs have been domesticated for perhaps 40,000 years, but they still retain some of the wildness in their DNA, which triggers their pursuit and in, in, instincts when something rushes past, be it a skateboarder, a bicyclist, or even a car. The dog might originally have been protecting its perceived territory, then gave chase as you roll by. The first recommendation experienced bike riders and dog trainers give is to, is to sprint if conditions are safe to do so. On rugged trails or steep hills, that might not be the one. <laughs> so basically saying, if you ever chase my dog, run a, run my hell. <laughs> right? Run my hell. But they say if you get if you're hiking in the woods and you come across a bear, what do you do? No. You do when you ever come across a bear in the woods, you don't run. Because running will trigger their their hunting instinct to chase after something, and you cannot outrun a bear. So what you do is you hold your ground and you yell as loud as you can while slowly backing up. So if I, so, let's say Jose is the bear. I'm just going crap, and he's like, Arr. what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my hands up and be like. Ah, go away, bear, go away. And as I'm doing that, I'm slowly backing away. Slowly. I'm slowly, I'm slowly backing away. He's gonna keep coming forward because he's, you know, but it, it, but if you turn and run, guess what's gonna happen? Gonna right. He's gonna come and chomp you down, right? Mm -hmm. and what you gotta do is get as big as you can. Ah, go away, bear, go away, go away. <laughs> and as you're doing that, you're slowly backing up, slowly backing up. And eventually, hopefully, they will just be like, you know what? Screw this, I'm leaving. <laughs> right? <laughs> Too much effort for a meal. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to do today in history, which again, we're going to go back and look at specific day, uh, years for today, November 23rd, 2020. So we're going to first we're going to look back to November 23rd, 1936. Life, the photojournalism magazine created by it. Henry R. Lewis was pub first published. So everybody knows Life Magazine, right? It was big. A lot of the soldiers during World War II, they would be grateful for having that new Life Magazine, right? When it would come in and they'll look at it. Why? Because it brought them closer to home again when they're fighting uh, in the Pacific or they're fighting in Europe or, you know, in, 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 in the Philippines. They were happy to to get something to read or look at that was from home, right? Sometimes they put a beautiful woman on there and they're like, woo, Judy Garland, ah, you know? So November 23rd, 1963, President Lyndon B. Johnson pro proclaimed November 25th, a day of national mourning following the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Do you remember that? You remember that? Where were you on the assassinate? When, when he got killed, where were you? You were at school? Yeah. Man. Ooh, that's scary. Man. 
That was when you were in high school? Man, that's scary. November 23rd, 1971. The People's Republic of China was seated in the UN Security Council. Wow, they're not there anymore. <laughs> no, I think so. I don't, don't quote me on that. November 23rd, 2001. That was 19 years ago. The UN War Crimes Tribunal said it would, it would try former Yugoslav president Slobodan Milosevic for genocide in Bosnia, linking him, linking him for the first time in court to the murders of thousands of non-Serbs and the displacement of a quarter million people. So back in the early 90s, when, uh, or no, mid-90s, this is when uh, Bill Clinton had his first term, right? He, he did a milita military intervention in Serbia because Serbs were committing, uh, Slobodan Milosevic's people were committing genocide. So they were basically doing what the Nazis did to people. For literally gypsies, Jews, anybody, like non-Serbs, non-quote-unquote Serbian people, which is stupid because they all look the same, you know what I mean? Yeah. They, they, their cultures have like 95% things in common. But that 5% or less that they don't have in common, they fight over for some reason. Doesn't make any sense to me. It's stupidity of the finest. So that's humans for you. You know, we all, let's say Jose and I, all right, Jose and I, we like everything. We agree and like everything except for bananas. He loves bananas. I hate bananas. But we love and agree on 100% of everything else. But I hate, but I love banana. I hate bananas. He loves them. We're gonna go to war because of that. <laughs> because you and your people like eating bananas, and I don't. <laughs> so you banana eating people are lesser. You need, you need to be eradicated. That's literally the thinking, right? That was like the thinking of Hitler, in a nutshell, right there. You don't like you like bananas. I don't. Screw you. I'm gonna kill you. Stupid. And a lot of people. We had a huge refugee crisis there too. So I actually went to elementary school and high school with people who were refugees to America from from Bosnia, yeah. and they had seen you know they're and, and I'm first grade. What am I seven years old? And I'm sitting next to a girl who literally saw her best friend's mom get shot in the head and die. Like I couldn't even imagine that. Oh. And every single day, them trying to get out of the country, they, were t they thought they were going to die. It was just a matter of time before a bullet was going to go through their head. That's terrifying. You had literally neighbors killing neighbors. You're next to my next door neighbor would try to kill me. Oh, why? Because he likes bananas and I don't. <laughs> oh, let's see here. So last part, we're going to do news of the weird. Again, news of the weird. This one's called Tardy Tufts. Tardy Tufts. Passerbys were, passerby were reported to be incredulous at signs posted since mid-September outside Trilliad Elementary School in Avignon, France. After parents asking parents to refrain from throwing their children over the lock gate when they are late to school. <laughs> parents who arrived after their ringtone literally threw their children away, Principal Sana Mazian told La Provence with a nervous laugh. While there were no injuries, the practice alarmed school officials enough to create the sign, which featured an adult stick figure tossing a child-sized stick figure over the gate. <laughs> Plus so elementary school, right? And say so you need to be there by eight o'clock. And at eight o five, the gates are closed. If they were late, the parents just throw the kid over the fence. <laughs> How funny is that? So they literally have a sign of a stick figure throwing out a little stick figure and saying no. Like if you go down to the Mexican California border, there's the big signs of the people running across the street. You have the mom, the dad, the two little kids running across the street, right? Oh my gosh, literally these people would throw their kids over the fence to get them to school. <laughs> All right, so thank you again for joining me for current events with my partner, Annie. Say hello, say bye. Bye bye. And my other partner, Jose, off camera, say see you later. See you later. All right.
again, my name is Diallo. I will see you next time. Thank you for joining me for current events on this day, Monday, November 23rd, 2020. Thank you. You're welcome. Don't get to go to the bathroom if you need to.